Hi everybody, welcome out to the Hi everybody, welcome out to the dice. Hi everybody, welcome out to the big one in the middle. These ones on the side. Hi everybody, welcome. That's not a good look. Hi everybody, welcome out to the Dice Tower. My name is Chris Yee and I am going This one's rickety. This is the biggest You're the weak link. You're the Hi everybody, welcome out to the Dice Tower. I'm going to take a look at three expansion We're going to be starting these three reviews from the smallest box size up to the largest because I'm in charge around these parts and I get to choose what we do here. That being said, I'm excited to talk about Trailblazers, the Sasquatch expansion, which comes with the fuzzy wooden meeple Sasquatch, which this alone I have seen drive people away from ever wanting to play this. And the other half of people looked at it and said, I need to play this. What is this? So this is a fourth game mode for the game of Trailblazers. I'm going to show you what comes in this box and how it's different. Here's a look a little bit into a game of Trailblazers with the Sasquatch expansion. It's going to come in this little tuck box, as you see. Not a whole lot here. The cards here are, uh, and these base games are actually from the base game. So it's mostly just this stuff here these new base cards and some Sasquatch components. The rulebook here has a link to a full tutorial. This will not be a full tutorial and a good explanation of how everything is going to work here, including the multiple kind of end game conditions that happen. And of course, these hidden roles. Players will either be a human enjoying nature or the Sasquatch. So if you are playing with three players, you'll have three human cards plus the one Sasquatch. If you're playing with four, you use all of these in the Sasquatch. Two players, you have two human cards, so on and so forth. So there's always a chance that every player is a human. You shuffle these up and then you'll deal these rolls out to players. And players will hide their role and try not to reveal that they are the Sasquatch by playing too obviously. When it is a player's turn, in this case a human's turn, they're going to draw cards from the deck here, and they're going to be adding out to the board in some way where they're trying to help create and finish pathways here. The card they don't use will be discarded to one of these displays. Now, as a human player, you're recommended to try to uh, look for the long pathway or what the most pathways are on this card and discard it to the matching color. So these brown hiking trails will get added over here, whereas if the card I was discarding had mostly orange, for example, I would want to put it over here if I were a human player. There is one other little wrinkle to the game, and that is that some of the cards do have animals, and this is from the basic game here. So as a human, you are trying to play more cards that have animals and prevent them from being discarded to this area because that is actually helping the Sasquatch, and I'll explain in a few ways exactly how that is. So when it's the Sasquatch's turn, they will draw cards, and if they have animals, they'll try to add it out here. They'll play one of these cards, and Sasquatches are usually trying to be helpful, so they maybe will do something like this and say, hey, look, I've finished this pathway, kind of hiding their identity. But the card they discard, they don't have to put it into a matching area. Maybe they'll do this. Now, as any player triggers the fourth or the eighth area, uh, you see these columns are highlighted here, you have to add more encampments out to the board. So maybe you'll do something like this, and now you're trying to create more of these pathways and such uh, to score more points. All of this in the service of a few things. Let me explain the end game now. So, one potential ending of the game is that the Sasquatch has not been revealed the entire time. Players may suspect someone. Uh, if they accuse wrong, the humans lose the game immediately and the Sasquatch wins. If they accuse the Sasquatch and they reveal him to be the Sasquatch, then uh, the last card that he played somewhere, he has to be revealed onto. Or the Sasquatch may choose to reveal themselves on their own turn at a more opportune time. Let's say by doing something like this. Playing this card, uh, I'm going to move all of this in the frame. The Sasquatch may choose to reveal themselves in a moment like this where they're really far away in an awkward position. They may say, ha ha ha, I'm the Sasquatch, and the marker gets added out here. Now, the players will have only a limited amount of time to try to, uh, to enclose the Sasquatch. The way to do that is they have to create a full loop using this card and one of the matching uh, trail types. So, maybe trying to make a water loop that goes from here all the way up, includes the Sasquatch's card, and comes back down, becoming an enclosed, uh, in this case, kayaking loop. These cards over here are shuffled up, 
And while the humans were seeding these cards with saying, okay, these ones are going to be primarily orange, these ones be primarily water, the Sasquatch has been throwing mismatched cards in there. Now, the Sasquatch is going to be out at this point once he's revealed, and the human players are going to be trying to enclose him. However, when humans draw cards, if they reveal a card that has an animal, that advances the Sasquatch marker here. Once five animal cards have been drawn, then the Sasquatch has gotten away. So the human players might be trying to do stuff like this to try to uh, get closer to making, uh, to making an enclosed loop that includes the Sasquatch. The next player goes, so on and so forth, uh, revealing more animal cards, potentially leading to his escape. Now, if the humans are able to create a long pathway that does enclose the uh, Sasquatch, they will win. But what happens if the Sasquatch is never revealed during the game? If everyone thinks that it's humans, but at the end someone says, ha ha ha, twas I, you will count the number of animal cards that were in these discarded piles up here, times a multiplier, and the humans' pathway scores have to be higher than the Sasquatch's score, or if the entire time it was actually a whole team of humans and no Sasquatch, there's a target score that the humans have to beat with the successful lines out here on the map. And that is the, the briefer explanation of Trailblazer's Sasquatch. So I tried to make that as brief an overview as possible, but this is a very strange expansion. This is not an expansion in the sense of the typical sense of like more stuff, more uh, objectives and scoring cards and cool cards, tiles that do weird things. No, this is a whole new game mode. Uh, Trailblazers, as a basic game, already came with three game modes. The first is the one that I play the most because Trailblazers is such a great, easy game to teach to people. Ryan Courtney is known for doing Pipeline, which was a heavy economic and tile building spatial puzzle. Uh, the second follow-up game to that was Curious Cargo, which was a very brain-burning two-player head-to-head spatial puzzle. Trailblazers is the version of his uh, pipeline-type stuff, this type pipeline-type uh, spatial puzzle that I really love and play the most because I can teach it to people. In that box, the second game mode added some complexity, and then the third game mode felt very different. This one feels even more different because of the hidden traitor way of playing a spatial puzzle game. I thought that was so strange, but you know what? I'm shocked and I'm very happy that it works. And it works very well. I feel like the fact that players are already struggling, just if you're a human good player, you're struggling just to make good connections as is cooperatively. I think that gives the traitor, the Sasquatch player, enough to do so that they can blend in and be helpful maybe try to do things and be like, oh yeah, let me help here. Oh, I made that actually harder than I realized or whatever. Uh, as the humans, you're trying to keep the, the puzzle nice and tight, but you can't always do that because you also need to try to score long, uh, you know, long fancy loops and such. So it gives the trader, the Sasquatch player, enough to do, enough to blend in, but enough ways to kind of slyly and coyly, you know, mix, mix things up a little bit here. When they reveal, it's kind of exciting. Or if it comes down to points and you're going through points at the end of the game and someone goes, ha ha ha, twas I! I was squatchy! That's cool! I can't believe this worked and it works rather well. That being said, I don't know that I would play this very often because I like the simplicity of the basic modes of Trailblazers. But if that's a game that you played a lot, this is going to be super cool and super different for you. And the fact that they made this compatible with all the different editions. There's the Deluxe, the Standard, and even the Travel Edition of, uh, of Trailblazers. So they did a great job with the production of this. They did a great job making this an exciting new thing. If you want more, and like very different more for Trailblazers. I'm coming down to a 7.5. Like I said, it's just, it's good. I don't see myself playing it all the time. But I could be convinced to come back to it because it works so well. So there you go, Trailblazers, Sasquatch expansion. The base game of Draftosaurus is in my top 100 games of all time. I rate it extremely highly. It's at least a 9. So, knowing that there were two expansions out there, I had to go hunt these down because I adore the simplicity and the fun of Draftosaurus, a great game that Camilla always describes as feels like a roll and write, but it's not. It gives you the tactile experience of building up your cute little dinosaur park 
So I had to hunt these two down. Let me show you what these two expansions add to the game. The two expansions for Draftosaurus are each going to come with five boards that are double-sided, so you can see both sides here, along with ten dino meeples of the, of the corresponding type, plesiosaurs in the marina expansion, where as you draft these, they'll go into your normal river spot. That's the only place they can go, not near other exhibits, but you can have one or multiple sitting here. And if you draft then the next type of dinosaur shown on the bridge here, uh, where a plesiosaur is waiting to cross, uh, if I take a T-Rex, for example, I can move as many of them as I have here. If I take a Triceratops, I can either branch it this way, so that they'll be worth four points at the end of the game, or I could try to go along this path, so that they're worth three, four, five, six points at the end. The A side, the other side, is just a much simpler path here, so that they can be worth two, three, four, or five. Now, over here in the aerial show, you're going to have Pterodactyls, uh, Pterodons, and when you draft these, they can only go to the mountains. So you have to place them either in, a, in space one, one of the spaces here uh, of your mountain board. And once you have one in this area, you are allowed to cross the bridge. So the next one you draft is allowed to go into one of these spots. And then lastly, over here to the last, the number three spot. This one branches just a little bit differently, the B side here. This is spot number one. All of these are available twos. And then the three is only available if you go this way. These just give you extra points. Uh, you can seed the board with some dinosaurs. That's what these eggs are. And if you place a pterodactyl there, whatever dinosaur was seeded from the bag at the start of the game, you get to put onto your board. Uh, they're worth points. Or you can even ignore the die for the rest of the game if you place three pterodactyls over here. So there you go. That's both the marina and the aerial show. So as you can see, each expansion does very little, right? A sideboard and some extra meeples. And I don't want these to overcomplicate the basic game, which they do a good job. They don't. They do not overcomplicate it. The hardest thing that they have to convince me is that they're worth the price point. We don't talk about price very often in reviews because price means something so different to different people. Uh, it is a little bit hard to justify, in some ways, the price of these expansions because they do offer so little and the basic game is relatively affordable, so spending more than the base game to get two expansions that add very little is sometimes a hard value proposition for people. That being said, if you love the game like I do, I think that these are nice, they fit in, they don't add too much, but I have one complaint about them, and that is that both of these add a dinosaur that when you get them in your hand, you look at it and you go, yeah, I'll probably take it, right? It, it, does, uh, it does have that little issue where I immediately, like, well, I'll probably just get the plesiosaur, right? Because it's going to turn into more points for me. I'm going to draft other dinosaurs anyway, so I'll probably be moving along that path. Or the, the pterodactyls, like, yeah, I'll probably get at least one. And part of it is not just that, you know, do I want the special one? Well, maybe some other ones will score me more points. But I don't want to be handing all of the special ones to the next player and they get all of them so that they can get that you know, seven point space, or unlock the ability to ignore the die roll for the rest of the game. That's big! So I feel kind of compelled, like, well, I might as well take advantage of it and not give it to the next player. So, unfortunately, my biggest complaint is, eh, I'll take the special dinosaur. Pretty much every time I have it, especially in the opening round, especially early in the first, uh, the first round of the game. So all that being said, not too much. Not too much complication. Great, that's a good thing. But I want, I, I don't know. I, I, I love that the basic game of Draftosaurus is so balanced that uh, every dinosaur isn't inherently better than the other. There's a little bit of inherent risk with taking the T-Rex, even though it's an extra point and the coolest dinosaur. But, you know, you might roll the die and be like, oh, I can't place in a pen where there's a T-Rex. So I like that little... A little give and take, and these ones have more give and less take. So for that, I'm going to be giving these ones, I'm going to give Aerial Show a 7 and uh, Marina a 7.5. I like both of these. I can recommend them for the fact that I think Draftosaurus is such an amazing game. And if you play it a lot, throw some more variety in there. Why not? Korra Quest Keep On Questin'. This is an expansion for, shockingly, Korra Quest, a game that I give a 7.5. I've had a lot of fun playing with my daughter uh, for years now, making up characters and laughing along at the gleeful, goofy stories 
coming up with some of our own stuff as well. It's a system that encourages creativity. So when an expansion came along, well, well, what does it add? Let me show you exactly what that is. Here's a smattering of what you're going to find in the core quest, Keep Quest and Expansion. You're going to see that there's more terrain cards here that are going to match different types of terrains that involve the, the new scenarios, the new stories. There's lava, there's ooey gooey slime and ice and such. There's going to be four new characters. I have a few of them shown up over here. There's new types of monsters that you'll be fighting with their own types of cards and bosses. There's going to be a few extra mechanisms here that I'll explain. But first, I want to show this delightful Visit West Orkshire uh, travel poster over here, which actually has two purposes. One, it is hilarious. I mean, just fantastic, great humorous touches. But this is actually a map of West Orkshire, which is going to show you the locations of the different quests that you'll be going on, because you can either play these quests as standalone adventures, or you can use the new campaign mode, which is shown in the rulebook here for Keep Questin'. So there's going to be a few new things explained here, how uh, just some of the new stuff works, like these new keywords, entangled, enchanted, and such. But it also is going to include rules to play through this as a campaign. The biggest changes that you should know is that there's going to be an introductory scenario for the first campaign. And then from there, you can choose which of the scenarios you want to go to based on the pictures on the map and the story and stuff as it unfolds. And the second one works a little bit of the same way. So there's two campaigns, each of five scenarios. Very simple, soft kind of campaign, wherein you are going to earn coins here as you discover treasure cards, open up treasure chests, and you can spend these Dan and Cora coins in order to level up your characters. As you spend these coins, you'll be leveling, getting these level up items here, which either, like the original Cora quest, will be an ability that you can spend your token on the cooldown track to activate, or you can purchase permanent abilities, which are going to add extra dice to your attack and give you just little boons here and there. So you can hold on to a few treasure items, you can hold on to upgrades, you can hold on to your coins to purchase more upgrades for the different characters in the campaign. You can level up the enemies little by little by giving them extra health onto their enemy cards as you complete the second and the fourth scenario of the campaign. A very simple, but very charming, more scenarios. That's Core Quest. Keep on questing. Keep on questing does several things absolutely right. First of all, I like that there are two campaigns in here, two five adventure campaigns that's short enough that it's meaningful, but still you feel like you can get through it. But also you can play every scenario as a standalone, just as a one-off. Your kid wants to fight the cool looking ice cream monster, let them do that. And the game does. That's great. I keep saying that in grown-up games. I just want to fight the cool iguanodon looking monster in this game. Hey, cool, a game that lets me do exactly that, great. I like the new terrains that it adds. I like that it, you know, it has these new little extra features that are just so simple. They used the opportunity here to clarify a few rules, which I like that, the FAQ they have in the back. I think that this is a good follow-up, uh, a good follow-up box. The new characters, fun. Uh, a little healer cat, a character from the first box. They, uh, they gave you an alternate version of that character so you could have a more reliable but less strong healer. I like that, right? Because my daughter likes that. This is this has always been a series focused on children because it was co-designed by a child and Cora Hughes. And so I think that that's a great touch there that it doesn't forget its core audience. It doesn't try to level this game up far too high. It does add some things. So if your kid has grown up a little bit since the original Cora Quest, you can say, hey, you want to do a campaign? You want to do these connected stories? But it still makes it so much fun forward. The stories are still hilarious. I like that you can kind of choose the order of several of the scenarios. And so it's you're not locked into this like grinding, gritty campaign. It's, do you want to go fight the ice cream monster or do you want to go to this other dungeon first? And the kid gets to pick. That's great. The level up system, very simple. It's fun to collect coins and it's fun to spend them on upgrades. Uh, but the upgrades are meaningful enough that it's, you do feel leveled up over the course of the campaign. After every few scenarios, you can level up the monster, you throw out a curse card, and so the game levels up a little bit. You're leveled up a little bit, but you're, you're kind of feeling better instead of uh, how the game is leveling up. It, does, it doesn't just keep up one-to-one -one straight with you, and I like that. It's such a good system. Even a small touch like this, adding in multicolored bags so you can keep track of your characters really easily between sessions. 
Stuff like that, it's just very thoughtfully made. That map that I showed you in the overview is a great touch. It adds to that sense of adventure and that sense of humor that this game nails so well. So I'm saying that this doesn't remove that drive for creativity. It doesn't remove any of that drive for making your own stories and making your own characters. Uh, it does still point back to that. You can still go online and do any of that stuff. It just gives you more tools to work with. I think that Korra Quest excels as a game that creates memorable stories and experiences with your family. And so the, the expansion here, Keep On Questing, just gives you more tools in that toolbox. I love that about it. I'm giving this one an eight. This is a market improvement. It even has a few little variation rules and stuff to uh, play the game shorter, which is something I do in my household. We don't run four characters. We run three or two. And so I just make the deck a little bit smaller to explore through, and we don't have to run alternate characters and stuff. So this box did a great job, an 8 out of 10 for me. So all of these expansions are getting a seal of approval, but this one is, this one's special. I really like it for that reason. Folks, that's been three expansion reviews. I appreciate you spending a little bit of your day here with me here at the Dice Tower, and I hope that this was good for you. Hope you find some good expansions yourself, and until next time, have fun gaming. Hey, if you like this video, then maybe you'll also enjoy Board Game Breakfast, a show that we do every other Monday morning featuring a bunch of contributors from all over the place. We also do Eye Catcher segment where we talk about something in the board gaming space that we found on the internet. And then also we do a top 10 list about all sorts of different topics, normally board game related or something weird. But then also we have a pick from the audience as the number one of our top 10. We also like to take a flash from the past. We go through some old school games, so older games that don't get to be talked about very much. We pick one of those every week. And then archives where we take an old Dice Tower video. We watch it, a little bit of it, discuss it, and just kind of see, hey, what was it like in the past? And then we also take a look at a question from the mailbag, questions that you all send in through the Discord channel. We answer it and discuss it. So come check out Breakfast every other Monday.